Okay, good morning, good morning Above Bar Church. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, Above Bar Church is a house of prayer for all nations. So wherever you're from, a very warm welcome to you this morning. My name's Chris Webb. Uh, I'm one of the ministers here. Uh, if you're new to Above Bar, please do go on our website and have a look there how you might be able to get to know us better by filling in a little form there so that we can actually connect with you. Please do stay for tea and coffee after the service as well. Uh, this is the first service of this year, 2024. We're going to have probably around 150 Sunday services because we have two sites. Uh, our other minister, Jonathan Berry, is with the East site this morning, and we're thinking of them as well as we worship together. I don't know how you feel uh, this morning. Uh, I must admit, I feel a little bit anxious. Didn't sleep last night, got this cold. Anne and I were coughing and sniffing all night, so um, I'm not going to shake too many hands this morning, but I do want to welcome you warmly to church. I also feel a little bit anxious, I must say, about the um, the international situation. I'm worried that the, the war in Gaza is going to escalate. Um, I'm worried uh, about many things internationally. I'm worried that Russia are going to win that war uh, in the heart of Europe. So I'm glad to come to, to church this morning and, and bring these things before our sovereign God. Um, can we just pray? Uh, and then I'd like us to stand and read something together. I'm going to pray. Lord, we bow before you, sovereign God, this morning. We thank you that you can make wars cease to the ends of the earth. And I just do pray for peace. Pray for peace, Lord, in our world that you would shatter the spear. Um, Lord, that you would uh, cause the earth to be still. And bring peace to our hearts this morning. Lord, help us to worship you. Help us to love Jesus more. Help us to get to know Jesus better. This morning we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our theme uh, today is a fresh start, which is very appropriate for a new year. Uh, our speaker is Rico Tice, uh, the author of Christianity Explored. We're going to do a Hope Explored course starting next uh, Wednesday evening, the 17th of January. Uh, that's a course for anyone investigating Christianity, anyone with questions, uh, we'll hear a bit more from Rico about that later. So a fresh start. I thought it would be good to read a little passage together that Jesus must have been thinking of in his interaction with Nicodemus, which uh, Rico will talk about later. I wonder if we can stand and we can just read this together. Uh, this was uh, a prophecy written many years before Jesus, but it does apply to each one of us as we come to know Jesus, something happens inside, a regeneration by the Spirit of God. So let's read these words. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. We are here together. We are here together to lift our hearts as one in our Father's presence. Spirit is with us. Oh, it is good. It is good to lift the name of the Lord our God. It is right to give His thanks and praise. Oh, his heart is overflowing in love for us, and his mercy we can never contain. Each and every morning, we tell of his great love. All these faithful mercies 
good to sing the name of the Lord our God this morning. Psalm 86 verses 9 to 10 tell us that all the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring your glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. As we worship this morning, we want to do something that reflects who we are as an intercultural church. So I'm going to invite Mehdi and Samran to come up this morning, and they're going to sing this next song with us. Some of it's going to be in English, some of it is going to be Persian. I recommend if you don't know Persian, you sing it in English. Uh, it will be very clear. We'll sing this together. This is going to be a little bit rough and ready. But actually, this is kind of who we are as a church worshipping together. Change and crumble at your name. The oceans roar and tumble at your name. At your name, angels about the earth will rejoice. Your people cry. Sing out your name. I'm I'm at your name. Sa 
Thank you, folks. Please take a seat. We want to kick off the new year with a week of prayer. Uh, we really need the Lord. Uh, tonight will not be a, a, a normal preaching, teaching service, but will be a prayer meeting uh, starting at 6.15. Uh, if you don't normally come, maybe uh, you would like to come this evening and begin our week with prayer. We'll have our normal um, Zoom prayer meeting tomorrow. Uh, at uh, 8 o'clock on prayer as well. Again, if you don't normally come, perhaps tomorrow you might choose to, to attend that. Uh, Jesus gave us a template to, to use when we pray, when we're 
struggling to find the words, and that's uh, known as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, again, to reflect our internationality, we'd like to invite people to, uh, to recite these words in uh, whatever is your heart language. Uh, the words will be in English on the screen, uh, and we will say this together now. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing again now. This is going to be an all-age song. Uh, I encourage you to stay where you are. You can stand. You can stand with me. Um, this song is called God is Good, and the chorus goes like this. It goes, God is good. God is good to us. And then all through time, every hour, every minute, God is good. God is good. If I can do that with a guitar, you can do that as well. I invite you to stand with us. This is God is Good. Here we are. Here we are, people of faith. Some with smiles, others with fears out of face. Here we come. Ready to bring who we are. Oh, sing God is good. God is good. God is good to us. All through time. All through time. Every hour, every minute. God is good. God is Sing this bridge, I encourage you to lift your hands in worship. This is an expression of worship we see throughout the Bible. As the people of God sing the goodness of God, they lift their hands in response. Oh, praise Him, for she is good. Sing that again, oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him, for she is good. Oh, sing praise Him. Testimony. Oh, praise, oh, sing, oh, praise him. him for his good. Oh, sing, oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. She's good. Oh, praise him. Oh,
Jesus, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that we can come together this morning and worship the God who is good. As we continue in our service now, we're going to send off our children and young people to their groups. Uh, I'm going to pray for them as they leave, and then we will continue in our worship down here as they continue in their worship up and around the building. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can come to your word. We thank you that we can come to the Bible and we can learn who you are. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us this morning in the many ways that you speak to us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord Jesus, we come before you with a heart overflowing with gratitude for the gift of freedom and your unwavering support through every twist and turn of life. Thank you for being our anchor, guiding us through the ups and downs with a love that knows no bounds. Father Lord, we are grateful for the freedom that surrounds us, a freedom that allows us to worship, express ourselves, and pursue the dreams that we have placed in our hearts. It's a freedom that many long for, and we don't take it lightly. Father Lord, we thank you for the sacrifices made on our behalf, providing a peace, space where we can live, love, and learn. Our Lord Jesus, in moments of joy, we feel your presence, and we thank you for being the source of every good things in our life, the laughter, the triumphs, and the celebration are all a treatment, testament to your grace. We are thankful for the simple pleasure that brings smiles to our face. And the bigger victories that remind us of your ab abundant blessings. Jesus Lord, during times of struggle, your support is our comfort. Thank you for being our rock the steady foundation on which we can stand your love left our when we feel weighted down and your light shines even in the darkest moment. We are grateful for the strength you pro provide, helping us to navigate challenges with faith and resilience. Lord Jesus, we appreciate the people you have placed on our journey, the friends, the church family, who have become a tangible expression of our love. Their encouragement, understanding, and companionship are priceless gifts. Thank you for waving a community around us that reflects your love and support, making the journey more meaningful. Our Lord, as we step into the unknown of the upcoming days, we place our trust in you. Thank you for the freedom to face the future with hope and courage. Guide us in making choice aligned with your will and grant us the wisdom to discern the path you have laid out for us. We are grateful for the insurance that you walk beside us, no matter what lies ahead. Father Lord, in this prayer of thanks, we lift our voice to express deep gratitude for your love, grace, and the freedom as we find in our presence. May our life be a reflection of your goodness 
and may we continue to express, experience the richness of your love in every aspect of our journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading this morning is from John 3, verses 1 to 16. It's on page 1065 of the Church Bibles. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do not understand these things. Very, I truly, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses, Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker this morning to you, uh, Rico Tice. Rico, that's a funny name you have. Uh, where have you got that name? Yes, it's a, it's a stupid name. It's not my fault. It's my parents' fault. So I was born in Chile in South America. My dad grew tobacco there. And uh, so I was christened Richard. I'm English by background, but that's Ricardo in Spanish, shortened to Rico. Just to say, it is Rico Tice, not T.K. Rice. I spent my life being called T.K. Rice, which sounds like number 42 at the takeaway, doesn't it? It's Rico <laughs> Tice, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your family and your background? Uh, yeah, I, um, I got through puberty at 38, so I got married at 42. <laughs> so I got married to Lucy, and uh, we have three kids. Um, Peter is 13. Daniel is 11. The word Daniel means the Lord is my judge, but he's not worked that out yet. And then a little girl called Mercy, who's eight. And with two older brothers, of course, it's ridiculous to call your daughter Mercy, because I spend my life going, Mercy! Leave Mercy alone! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, she, um, uh, she actually, we lived in such a tiny flat in central London that she actually slept under the stairs for the first five years of her life. We just took the cupboard out and put a bed in under the stairs. So she'll be screwed up later on in life. Pray for her. Anyway... <laughs> A bit like Harry Potter, isn't it? Anyway, there she was. Wow. Okay. Um, Rico, so your, your parents were not Christians. Yeah. Um, how did you become a Christian? Yeah, I had loving parents, very loving. But I, I got converted, really, when my godfather was killed in a cliff fall when I was 15, on the 6th of August, 1982. And a lot of people say coming to faith is a bit like waking up. And when my godfather was killed... I, I woke up to the reality of our mortality. I think many people, COVID, the same thing happened, you know, in, in, in 2022, that, that sense of our mortality. So I think that was that. And then there was a, a math teacher at my school, a guy called Christopher Ash, and he said to me, when Jesus got through death, he got through death to get you through. And I remember thinking, if that's true, it's the most important thing in the world. And so, you know, that theme of hope explored, um, that theme of hope really, really brought me to faith. It was mortality. It was the knowledge that I would die that I think caused me to, to look for Christ. Awesome. Um, you just mentioned central London. So you've worked a lot of your life in central yeah. London. Can you tell us the, what you're doing now? 
Yes, um, while I was at All Souls Langham Place, so some of you may have heard of John Stott, it was the church that, that he was at at the top of Regent Street, built as a thanksgiving for victory over the French at Waterloo, so whenever the internationals come along, I think about that. Welcome if you're French, lovely to have you here. <laughs> and uh, I think we're going to lose to you, but anyway, there we go. But, um, but, but uh, I was there, and I just for three decades, for 30 years, um, had a huge privilege of people coming in asking whatever questions they like, but unashamedly saying, here's the person of Jesus in the Bible. And that little Hope Explored course was something we developed, the one that you're running on the 17th here for three Wednesdays. Just come with whatever question you've got, but unashamedly we want you to look at the person of Christ as we look at your questions too. And so um, I spent my time developing that material, and I'm now doing that full time. Awesome. But the word hope has been bandied around quite a bit. I saw Keir Starmer talking about hope this week. What, 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 what is the Christian hope? Well, I think there are two different types of hope. One, one hope is, I hope it won't rain tomorrow. Another hope is, if you're getting married, and I, about Lucy coming to, the, coming to the, uh, the wedding, I hope my bride turns up. And uh, the second one, that hope, is based on a relationship and a promise. We promised each other we would get married. And I think there's a promise about the future that Jesus gives us, and he guarantees it by rising from the dead. So the past certainty of Christ's resurrection, if that's true, that gives me this future hope. And of course, Christmas, when time and again as we get older, our loved ones aren't there. I mean, my, my parents never met um, two of my kids. And, you know, I just, I, you know, we, we miss these people we loved so much. But the hope of Christ promises me a day of reunion and, uh, and a future. So if that's true, it changes everything, I think. So anyway, I think it's hope that's based on... I don't know what Keir Starmer's basing it on. And by the way, this isn't a political interview. I've no idea. Um, uh, but I, I do know that Jesus says I've risen, so that's what the, the basis is. Awesome. You've started to preach now, so... I'll, no, no, I'll I haven't. You, I'll, stop. I'll let you get on with it. Oh, Rico, am I going yeah. straight up? Yeah, great, you're going great. straight up. I'll pray for Rico as he uh, pray, comes yeah. up. Father, thank you uh, for Rico's life and ministry uh, and commitment to the gospel, and we just really pray that you would speak through him now. We thank you that when someone opens up your word, it's, it's not simply their words, but you speak. Um, and so we pray with anticipation that you might speak to us this morning. Amen. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much. Well, it's a privilege to speak on the first Sunday of the new year as we, as we come to today, and uh, absolute joy to be with you. And um, I wonder if you could open the passage we had so well read for us, John chapter 3, as we come to that. So if you can get back to your Bibles, page 1065, 1066. You know there are three important dates in English history, don't you? 1066, the Battle of Hastings. 1666, the Great Fire of London. 1966, we won the World Cup. But anyway, there we are. We'll leave that. Um, if you can have that open there, and let me... Uh, uh, let me pray. Father, please speak to us, address us, and we pray, Father, we dare to pray that what we hear now, we'd remember all our lives and it would take us into eternity. Amen. Well, for this new year, I thought I'd ask this question. I don't know if you've ever done that, but have you ever played that game? Here's my question. If I had my life all over again. Now, of course, you won't do that unless you're over 30, because if you're under 30, you think you're going to get your act together again. But if you're over 30, and certainly by the time you're 40 and you think you've had half your life and your body starts telling you that, so I've now got a furniture problem, my chest is in my drawers nowadays, <laughs> you start to get wistful about the things you haven't had a chance to do. And I think between Christmas and New Year, that little gap, maybe we start pondering these things. Now, of course, some people can't relate to that at all. I spoke to one person and she said to me, well, if I had my life all over again, I'd do exactly what I've done. And I thought that showed a singular lack of imagination. What do you want to do the same things again for? Don't you want some different experiences? So, for example, I'd love to have played a season's rugby with the Maoris in the South Island of New Zealand or with the, the deeply Christian Western Samoans who are the heaviest tacklers in world rugby. Apparently, their motto is Acts 20, verse 26, it's better to give than receive. <laughs> I'd like to have learned to play the saxophone. I think that's such a cool... Or the bagpipes... I don't know, been a door-to-door -door salesman or married that girl I married to someone else. That would have been interesting when I got the bit in the service when I said, does anyone have any reason why they shouldn't get married? I only put my own hand up. But that would have been fun. But I mean, you know, but, but, you know 
or play golf at Augusta. I'd love to play golf at Augusta. But the thing is, of course, as I say these things, and maybe you've thought about them over the new year, we can't start again, can we? We can't start again. It's just a game. But you know, the extraordinary thing is, when it comes to the Christian faith, ladies and gentlemen, and by that I mean when it comes to having a relationship with the God who made us, that's what we're talking about, the God who shines the sun in today, a relationship with him, can I say, unless you do start again, you never make it. That's what we're told in John 3 here. Can you see how Jesus is so uncompromising, so abrupt, so clear about the need to start again? Have a look down at your Bibles, if you could. And can you see, we've got it in verse 3, 5, and 7. Verse 3. Very truly, I tell you, unless you, uh, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Do we see it there? And then verse 5. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. And again, verse 7, do we see, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. You know, unless, unless there are rain, there's no crops. Unless you're born again, there's no relationship with the God who made us. There's no Christianity. So Jesus has been quite categoric here. A person cannot be a Christian unless he or she is born again. They can't enter the Christian life unless that happens. It is fundamental to Christianity. Now, at this point, I have to tell you that the phrase born again, it's got the most terrible PR, hasn't it? Terrible PR because we all think it maybe was invented by Donald Trump to get more votes off the Southern Baptists. Welcome if you're American. Lovely to have you here. But what I'm, what I'm saying is this phrase, ladies and gentlemen, this is so important. It doesn't refer to some narrow, emotional, cultic, fringe type of Christianity, which people like my dear mother used to dismiss by saying, well, I'm a Christian, but not one of those born-again types. In fact, this, relate, this sermon is in some ways dedicated to her. Uh, no, this necessity of new birth is in the original articles of every single Protestant church. It's embedded in all the original Protestant creeds. It's a, it's a non-negotiable whether you were Anglican, Baptist, Methodist, whatever you were growing up, it's absolutely non-negotiable. It's not weird, it's not strange, it's not new, it is not loony fringe, it's dynamite about a creator God who breaks into people's lives. That's what we're talking about. And often undetonated dynamite, people don't know about it. So please remove any unreflexive prejudice about it. It's not something bizarre. It's not for dogmatic, crazy people. It's not an option. It's a necessity. And there could have been nobody who was more shocked that he had to be born again than the man at the start of our chapter. Can we have a look down and see him? Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. You see, this man had supposedly all the right credentials to be accepted by God. He, he, the, the, you know, so, so surely he doesn't have to start over. Surely not him. I mean, he's a disciplined man. He's a Pharisee. They were a lay movement who were so sick of the professional religious, they said, we'll take it seriously. Watch us. He was an able man on the Jewish ruling council. He was a learned man. Do you see verse 10 as we look down? You're Israel's teacher. And he's open. I love it in verse 2. Do you know, some people stop asking questions. Some people won't come to Hope Explored because they say, I don't have any questions. Here's this man. He says, do you know, I've still got some questions. He's humble enough to come with his question. So he's disciplined, he's able, he's learned, he's open. He'd have been a thoroughly honest man in business, a law and order man. He'd have been a faithful husband, a church leader. He would have been a diligent Bible reader. You don't actually get more moral than the Pharisees. They were fanatics on morality. So there's no one more moral, legalistic, upright, or Rotarian than this man. He's the ultimate in middle-class responsibility. So he would have been deeply shaken, ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus says to him, you, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. When Jesus steps back and draws a separating line between him and real relationship with God. That's what he's doing here. Now, actually, when someone said to me that I needed to be born again, I, I was so self-obsessed. 
I was so self-centered. I remember thinking, I, I bet I do. I could utterly relate to Tennyson's words, ah, for a man to arise in me that the man I am may cease to be. I kept a diary because I thought I was such a great guy. I owed it to the world to record my life. Found out I was a total burke. It was amazing. Night after night. You know, I'd write in the diary, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if there was world peace, but never lay aside the weapons of malice and sarcasm in my own self-defense. I'd say, you know, wouldn't it be great if the starving were fed, but I'd ask my parents for a larger allowance, and as you can see, I would eat it. I mean, you know, there was just this, this separation between what I was and what I should be. I was in such a shambles, it didn't occur to me that I didn't need to make a fresh start. But this is such a thoroughly fine man. He's such a good man. So he's shocked that Jesus says, you must be born again. So do you see what happens in verse 4, what he replies? Have a look, verse 4, can we see? How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb. And Jesus to that says, now don't muck about me, Nicodemus. Don't muck about. He says, I'm not talking about physical things. I'm talking about spiritual things. Yes, you need to be born physically. Verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh. But you also need to be born spiritually. Verse 6, the spirit gives birth to the spirit. And Nicodemus, all your religious credentials, disciplined, religious, able, learned, moral, all that performing, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. And it will not save you over the page. Do we see this? From the wrath to come. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not, does not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Nicodemus, this won't save you from hell. There's a place called hell, and it won't save you from it, all you're performing. And I think we can therefore conclude that if a thoroughly good man like this needs to be born again, then we can be absolutely sure that you need to be born again, and I need to be born again, and do raise this at Hope Explored, but so does the kind Buddhist, the gentle Hindu, the moral atheist, the fine Muslim, whatever your cultural or religious background, Jesus insists you must be born again. Whatever your background. And I think the question is, why? Why? Why do you have to be born again? Why is this so important? And it's because the Bible, and we have to hear this on New Year's Day, on, on a new year, the Bible says all of us, one way or another, have said no to God. We won't have God as God. We've all done it. Even Nicodemus has done it. And when we do that, and that's called sin, to just say no to God in his world, it seems such a tiny, pathetic little world. When we go, well, look, it's my goals, it's my agenda, it's my desires... God, you, you're here, thanks for each breath, but you be a footnote. But when we do that, now, ladies and gentlemen, we must understand that. It seems such a small thing to us, this sin thing, and increasingly in the culture. But when we do that, ladies and gentlemen, it causes us to die spiritually. It causes spiritual death. So all over Southampton today, there will be people who are young, fit, attractive, witty and intelligent, but spiritually, they are walking corpses. And we don't understand the Christian faith unless we see how serious sin is, and that's why there's this absolute necessity to be born again. Again, Jesus doesn't, says, he doesn't say can be, should be, like to be. He says you must be. You must be, verse 7. It's so emphatic. So what is new birth then? What does it mean to be born again? Well, can I tell you what it doesn't mean? This doesn't mean turning over a new leaf. This doesn't mean going back on the diet again. I'm not talking about something moral here. As we get to New Year, I'm not saying here's another New Year's resolution. We're not talking about that. Three or four years ago, I gave up all puddings except on my day off for a New Year's resolution. Then on my first day off, I had six. It was a disaster. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Ladies and gentlemen... I am talking about something, now please hear me, that God does. This is something God does. It's a radical change that God does through the power of his Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. Can we have a look at verse 8 and see that? 
So verse 8, as we look down, Jesus says, you must be born again, verse 7. And then he says, to explain it, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So it's not something I do, it's something God does. And here's the key word this morning. It's a miracle. This is a miracle that God does. It's not something I do. And and God brings us back to life as new people in the Spirit. He radically changes us in our thinking. So this is a supernatural act of God in which he takes his Holy Spirit and he implants him, the Spirit, in the base of our hearts and he gives us a heart transplant. That's what we're talking about. A heart transplant. Where, 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 where our mind, will, and emotion and personality take on a whole new direction. So we start to think like he thinks, and consequently, oh gosh, we make such a mess of it. But we start trying to act in God's way. We start trying to, to follow the Lord Jesus. We, we, we find him so magnetic and I remember speaking to a rugby friend, and, and I was urging him to become a Christian. And, and he said, look, Rico, it's no good me becoming a Christian. He said, I'll never keep it up. And I said to him, Matt, when I look at your track record, you're right. I don't think you can keep it up. I said, what do you think you need for you to keep going as a Christian? And he shrugged his shoulders, and he looked at me, and he said, well, I reckon I need a miracle. Well, at that point, I nearly fell off my chair, because that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about a miracle where the person looks the same, but there's a radical change that's taken place, and God has caused us to leap into the spirit world. Gosh, it's a wonderful thing. And he's given us a heart transplant, and I, can I say again, you can't do it yourself. This isn't about trying harder this new year, as we have our whatever resolutions we've got. Uh, let me tell you what it was like for me. I mean... Before it happened to me, I really didn't worry about God, although I do remember praying, oh God, please get me through this exam and I'll become a pastor. Yeah, and here we are. Here we are. (laughs) But I didn't care about God as long as he looked after his bits and, and he left me to do my bits. I didn't care about him. But you know, when God changed me, do you know what? I started to love him. I started to love him. And he's much more real to me than any of you are. I started to love him. It was amazing. And I was so glad at what he'd done for me. And before it happened to me, do you know, I I picked up the Bible and I just thought it was gobbledygook. We'd have scripture at my primary school. Uh, Honestly, we'd have a a scripture lesson. I mean, I just thought it it was written 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away. Had nothing to do with me. In fact, I used to spend my time going through the Bible, trying to make it relevant. Four years of scripture lessons, looking for references to rugby. I found a number I was pleased with. One to referees, John 9, verse 1. I knew a man blind from birth. Another one to foul play, Acts 13, verse 3. So Paul and Barnabas were sent off. I mean, it was just a game. It was just a game. And then, after God changed me, after he changed me, ladies and gentlemen, it was like... My name and address was in the Bible. And I'd open it up and it would be written for me. Now, again, I don't know how your Bible reading's going here. But can I say, if you've stopped, and we all do, start again. Start again this new year. But you open it up, it's like a mirror. It's uncomfortable. We have to go to God for forgiveness. But I started opening the Bible. I couldn't believe how it spoke to me. And before I became a Christian, I only ever prayed when I was in trouble, but after God changed me, I spoke to God as though he was a friend. And before I became a Christian, there were many sins I didn't give a fig about, as long as I wasn't found out, but afterwards they became very ugly to me because I knew they grieved the Lord Jesus. It was a radical change, a heart transplant, it was being born again. Look, it's not unlike surgery. You know what it's like with surgery? By the way, if you haven't had surgery, it's great fun, you know. Think of a bit of your body you don't want and go and get it cut off. That's what I'd recommend. But, but you know with surgery, the anaesthetist comes in, plunges something into your arm, and the most wonderful euphoria sweeps over you, 
and all the nurses look absolutely beautiful, and they put you on a trolley, and the ceiling floats by, and the doors swing open, and you see the surgeon, and the next thing that happens, they go, wake up, wake up, wake, wake up. And within half an hour, you know they've done something. Within an hour, you wish they hadn't. <laughs> within three hours, you think you're going to die, and after six hours, you're afraid you won't die. Don't you find? <laughs> now, can I say, that's not unlike new birth. You're not conscious of it, but as you keep hearing the Bible, God does the miracle underneath. It's not just an academic thing. As you hear the Bible, there's this miracle taking place. And he's done it in so many others, and he's doing it for you. So your job is just to keep hearing the Bible. So you come along to Hope Explored, and you say, I've got my questions, and I'll hear the Bible. And you hear the Bible... And can I tell you, God does the miracle. And you suddenly go, do you know, I think Jesus did die for me. And I think he rose again. And I think he's very real. And I'm suddenly grieved about things I was never grieved about. It's an amazing thing. So your job is to keep hearing, well done coming this Sunday morning. Come next week. Keep hearing the Bible. Come to Hope Explored. Brilliant. That's what we do. We keep hearing God does the miracle. So what is new birth? It's a radical change. God does by his spirit. Who needs new birth? We all do. It's not newly loony fringe. Even Nicodemus needed it. Thirdly, what is it that God has done so that I can be born again? Can we have a look? John 3, verse 16. Let's have a look over the page as we come to the end of the passage. John 3, 16. This is what God has done so I can be born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So what did God do? He loved the world. And because he loved the world, because he loved you this new year, what did he do because he loved you? Can you see what he did? He gave his one and only son, the Lord Jesus. So God allowed Jesus to die on the cross to take the punishment which our sins deserve. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have I been forsaken? He was forsaken, so you need never be. After we lived in Africa, we then, uh, 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 in Chile, where I was born, we then went to Africa. And as a little boy in Africa, there was no TV, and I had hobbies. Stamp collecting and butterflies, both were brilliant. And for both of them in Africa, you needed one of these little magnifying glass. But I soon found, as a five-year-old in Africa, that making little things bigger was not the only thing a magnifying glass could do. I found that if you took one of these into the midday sun, the possibilities were endless. <laughs> so you could set alight a, 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 a leaf or a piece of newspaper or even the gardener's hut. And best of all, I found, if you held your twin sister down, you could scare the living daylights out of her with one of these. That was before I thought of ordination into the Anglican church. You see, you can take a magnifying glass and focus the rays of the sun into such a sharp point of intensity it burns things. Well, imagine a massive moral magnifying glass the size of this room. And through it are past, not the sun's rays, but God's righteous anger at the selfishness, the hatred, the self-centeredness, the gossip, the lust, the anger in my heart, let alone yours. And imagine all God's anger comes down, 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 and it hits one man at one point in history, and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what God does so that you can be born again. And over Christmas, we heard a lot about the word Jesus, didn't we? And what does it mean? Well, do you remember Luke, uh, Matthew 1, 18, you're 21? You'll give him the name Jesus, Joseph is told, because he'll save his people from their sins. So the name Jesus means saviour. So let me give you a New Year's resolution. Every time you hear the word Jesus, and sometimes on the golf course I hear it a lot, can I tell you, say to yourself under your breath, he died for me. Let's rehearse it. Jesus, just under your breath, he died for me. Jesus, he died for me. That's what he did. God sent his son to die for you so that the new birth is possible. Jesus, he died for me. So that is what God has done. He has sent his son to die so that you can be born again. And then as we close, what does God want us to do? What does he want us to do? 
so that we can be born again. Okay, who needs it? We all do. What is it? A miracle. What's he done? He sent his son to die. What does he, what does he want us to do? Let's have a look down. Let's close with this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, trusts him, will have eternal life. What does it mean to be trustworthy? It means you keep your word. So if I say to you, first one up to the front after the service gets 20 pounds, if I'm trustworthy, I'll give you 20 pounds. I'm not, so don't bother coming. <laughs> but if you're trustworthy, you keep your word. Now, what's God's word? He says you won't perish. You don't have to go to hell for your sin. That's how serious it is but you won't perish. I've sent my son to die. He says, you won't perish. If you trust me, then he says, I'll forgive you and I'll send my spirit. And we trust the Lord by making a decision. Becoming a Christian isn't like catching mumps. You know what it's like? Your throat's sore and the next day it's all up. No, becoming a Christian is like getting married. You don't wake up the day after you've got married in your marital bed and look across and say, hello, what are you doing here? By the way, if it was like that for you, you're in need of greater help than we can give you. (laughs) No, I took took a marriage just before Christmas. And I I said to the groom, David, I said, David, will you have Alice? Do you notice, I I said, Will. I didn't say, how do you feel? Because he was sweating like like a dog. He was sweating in the middle of winter. But I said, David, what have you made up your mind to do about this young woman? Will you have her for, for your lawful wedded wife, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse? Do you know what for better, for worse means? It means whatever the in-laws are like, for better, for worse. <laughs> for better, for worse, will you forsake all others and stay with her? And he said, I will. That's what I intend to do. And so God says to us this new year, what do you intend to do about the death of my son? I sent my son to die. What do you intend to do about the death of Jesus? That's what he's asking us. He says, will you put your trust in me today? Will you believe that I can make you a new person, I can forgive you, and that we can start again? Because we need to reverse this mess we're in and trust Jesus to forgive us, to cause us to be born again, and then to lead us. He's died for me. I can trust him in every area to lead me. The agony of the Church of England, where I'm from at the moment, is that the leadership have decided they won't trust Jesus on some key issues. It is absolute agony. But I'm saying to you, will you trust Jesus? Trust him to know what's best. And uh, here's a prayer that enables us to trust Jesus. Let me close with that. For some of you this new year, it might be the right one to pray just this day. What a great day to do it. Let me uh, uh, say it now. It's coming up on the screen, but here it is. Heavenly Father, you haven't been at the center of my life. I want you to be in your rightful place, master of my life. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Please forgive me and please send your Holy Spirit to make me into a new person. Well, that's a great prayer to pray. And if it's right for you, this New Year's Day, this new year, why not make a fresh start and pray it? God's done all the work. He sent his son to die. He'll send his spirit to change you. You just have to trust him. Just put your hand into his hand. So let me pray it phrase by phrase. Let's pray together. And for some, it might be right to become a Christian today. So here it is. Heavenly Father, do echo it in your own heart in the quiet. Heavenly Father, you haven't been at the center of my life. I want you to be in your rightful place. Master of my life. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Please forgive me. And please send your Holy Spirit to make me into a new person. Amen. Now, if you've prayed that prayer, I'd love to see you at the end. I've got a booklet I'd love to give you, but also maybe you'd like to sign up for Hope Explored on the 17th. Do come with your questions. It is right for us to respond to God's revelation to us in worship. It's good for us to sing of... Uh, what he has done for us, how that can change and transform our lives. I invite you to stand with us.
we're going to sing, It is finished, the Messiah dies. It is finished. It is finished. The Messiah dies. Shut up from sins, but not his own. Completed is the sacrifice. A great redeeming work is done. Yes, it is here. The dead is paid. Just his divine is satisfied with grand atonement made God for a guilty world is The temple curtain is torn down the living way you have me seen and Christ the middle wall is gone oh, who will may enter in the ancient shadows are fulfilled the scripture prophecies prove true the sinless lamb of God is given the promise Satan and his pretended throne are swallowed up in victory. See from the curse of God I am. My Savior hangs upon a tree. See there the meek and silent lamb, his final breath he breathes for me. Oh, he breathes, he breathes to me. When Christ accepted and brought me, and brought me right, she's just divine. I see the path to life made clear. next song we're going to take up our offering this is an opportunity as a church for us to give back to God and your worship to him
Well, it's great to um, hear the way of salvation um, so clearly proclaimed and the invitation to respond and put your trust in Jesus and to sing about it as well. Um, Rico's a man of his word. He said, how long should I preach for? I said, 25 minutes, feeling sure he would take 30, but uh, it took 25, so um, we're finishing a little bit early, which is lovely. Um, just two main announcements. Um, the first is that uh, we are having a week of prayer. Uh, really, that, that means that we're going to have a, a prayer meeting tonight here at 6.15 to kick off the year. There'll be praise, there'll be worship, and we'll bring uh, the year before the Lord. Um, Zoom prayer meeting tomorrow, and then home groups this week will be uh, focused on prayer for the year. And then the, the Hope Explored course. So our theme for Christmas was hope. Um, our theme today was a fresh start and the hope of the gospel. And we, we do hope that there'll be lots of people coming to that course that starts on the 17th of uh, January. Please do sign up on the website 
A lot of our information is on the website. There is a QR code and the seats in front of you can just scan and that's easy to get onto the website there. Uh, just a, one other notice, I've been informed that one of our older members, Mary Wallace, has been awarded uh, a medal, uh, a British Empire medal, for her services uh, over many years as a nurse. And Mary, we'd like to honor you um, just with a little round of applause. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.